The Vessel Chronicles, Book 1, A Burial of Storms, by Jordan Owen, copyright 2013. Chapter 2, Peter. Yuki and I became statues of caution in that instant as the vast array of yellow glowing eyes surrounded us. We were aware of purring, but it was the purring of a dark, malevolent sort that has always confounded me. It is laughter at impending misfortune, apparently ours. I have always been puzzled by creatures who want to cause pain to others. It is as if, in an odd way, they seek the approval of those they are hurting. Perhaps it is because they are unable to find real enjoyment in life, and so they instead go about impressing their victims with the morbid lengths of their own depravity. I feel sorry for such creatures and want, more than anything, to tell them that everything is okay. Whatever the case, Yuki seemed less confused by it than me, so I let him do the talking. We are refugees, said Yuki, the force in his voice masking his trepidation. We seek asylum. We heard your approach, hissed another voice from the shadows. You brought them with you. They've given up the chase and left us for dead, brother replied. But they could still follow your trail. No, my brother and I, we escaped from the farm where we lived. They were out to kill my mother and our littermates. They're only looking for us. Do you know if any of your littermates survived? I know they got our mother. I don't know about the others. But we were the only ones who set out in this direction. I know that. You fool! You may as well have led them to our location. Look, Article 51 of the Emergency Pact Doctrine declares that all packs must welcome their own kind. Yes, yes, newcomer, I'm quite aware of what the EPD says, but you'll join on our terms. Both of us, stammered Yuki defiantly. I saw one set of eyes, apparently the set talking, look around Yuki to where I was crouched just behind him. That's your litter mate? hissed the ominous voice. He's my brother, yes. You think we'll hunt for that? scoffed the shadowy voice. He should have been left out to starve years ago. Yuki bristled and growled. Patience, newcomer, replied the voice snidely. You'll have your chance. Come with us. We could sense motion in the shadows, and we followed it, sinking deeper into the darkness. I could sense the feet of four or five cats. What did he mean by your chance, I whispered to Yuki as we walked. I don't know, Peter, he replied. We shall see. Yuki was about the only one in the family that didn't hate me. I don't know why the others hated me, and maybe hate is too strong a word, but whatever it was, I just figured it was better to focus on Yuki than to worry about the ones who didn't care for me. I remember being afraid early on because my eyes didn't open on time. My world was a slow, daily procession from one side of the hayloft to the other for mother's milk and back again. After a time in the darkened void, I felt a presence next to me, Yuki. He was warm, like all of them, but there was immediacy to his warmth, like he was trying to pass it off to me. I wish I had more stories. Yuki has the stories. I'm just kind of there. I, I don't know why, but I've always felt like there was something about life that made existence itself something to experience through quiet contemplation, like a painting in a gallery. When my eyes were finally opened, I was fi I was fascinated by the most by the moist amoebic colors that intermingled beneath the glow of the single light bulb in the barn and watched fascinated as they became sharp and finite, the colors solidifying into wood, straw, and metal. I do have one story, though. I guess I haven't seen enough 
things to have very many, but this one really stuck out in my mind. I, I wasn't very strong when I was really little, but I remember when Mother started taking the others out of the hayloft to learn how to hunt and fight. She would carry them down one by one and set them on the floor of the barn, then carry them out. During that time, I would be left alone in the barn, and suddenly the barn would seem big and empty. I heard the screeching and growling of battle training and recognized Yuki's voice as one of the two sparring. I had been lying in my usual spot and climbed to my feet, looking out across the rolling, barren landscape of the hayloft. The piles of straw were dunes in a blurry desert, and I began to crawl across them, determined to traverse the hayloft unassisted. The going was tough, and I was scared the whole time, but I wanted to see the training, or at least try to. When I finally arrived at the hayloft window, I lay down against the wood beams and gazed down. There were two forms, one a white shape, Yuki, and the other a patchwork of greys, Simon. They circled first, their backs arched and precise, then they dove at one another, their arms wrapping around each other's throats. Yuki had Simon quick. He was on top of him in a heartbeat, but Simon rabbit kicked with his back feet and threw Yuki over his head and into the mud. Yuki rallied fast and caught Simon by the throat. Simon tried to bring his feet around again, but Yuki slid under him and held fast to the scruff of Simon's neck. There was a blurry twisting between them, and Simon was pinned to the ground, twitching his tail. Yuki held Simon like that while Mother, who had been circling around them, counted to ten. Simon and Yuki separated, bowed to one another, and went to join our brothers and sisters off to one side of the muddy path where Mother had been doing the training. It was odd watching Yuki walk off the arena in that moment. He moved with a precision that seemed alien to him. The smoothness with which he'd taken Simon to the ground and the mindless efficiency in his movements afterwards. As my wincing eyes adjusted to seeing further than a few feet in front of me, I began to make out a subtle shift in his tone. His solemn demeanor and cold focus were like a mask that fit hauntingly. When Yuki returned that night, I asked him to tell me about battle theory. Still lost in the reverie of the gladiator, he began speaking excitedly about the process, the precision, and the intricacies of the fight. But after a while, he realized I wasn't looking at him anymore, that I was looking away from his gaze and into my own thoughts. "'What's on your mind, Peter?' he asked after a moment. I thought about that for a long time, needing to figure that part out as well. Brother, what is it about fighting that makes you so happy? The silence was prolonged once again. Then Yuki replied, I think that it's part of who we are, Peter. Cats? No, not cats, but cats are part of it. All things that know they are alive know that just being alive isn't enough. They need to live as well. Not just survive, but thrive. I think that being alive means facing conflicts and coming out ahead. Life is a fight, a struggle. And just like we need to eat, to uh, we need to struggle. It's what gives us satisfaction. But he trailed off again because I'd stopped listening again. But brother, I said carefully as I returned to his gaze, I can't fight. I'll never be able to fight. What does that mean? You'll be able to fight some day. I'm sure you will, he stammered, then licked my head. He slept close to me that night, like he always did, but as I watched him sleep, I wondered if that love of the struggle was going to pull him away from me. He was the only one in the litter that gave me the time of day, but I would ultimately hold him down. I wondered if I would ever have a litter of my own to look after, and if I'd be able to kill for them. Yuki would be able to do that. He would be able to go out and have a family and kill for them. My life was the hayloft. Yuki's life was beyond it. After se what seemed like miles, we came to an open spot, the harsh marks in the ground indicating the leaves and brush had been cleared by other cats. 
there was enough light coming in through the trees that the feline shadows solidified and I saw now that we were surrounded by three gray tabbies and a cat that was solid black. The solid black cat was flanked by the others so I took him to be some kind of leader. His coat was ravaged with scars that looked as if they'd healed only after significant infection. Still, for all his tattered appearance, he was not frail. Quite the contrary. This was a creature who had no doubt seen many battles and, as if by some process of osmosis, absorbed the muscle mass of each of his kills. His eyes were solemn and arched, though not with the sort of aristocratic bent one normally sees in cats. This was the gaze of one who stood poised and ever ready for the kill, his savagery mediated only by the circumstance and not well even then. We came to a halt, and the bushes before us rustled. An old cat, obviously once a great fighter, but now withered and gray from the forward march of time, emerged guarded by two more soldiers. "'What bring you, Bigum?' asked the old cat in a commanding, though wavering voice. The big black, apparently named Bigum, responded, "'Elder, my patrol found these trespassers.' Not trespassers, Excellency, interjected Yuki. We seek asylum. You'll speak when spoken to, shot the elder, and Yuki's mouth clamped shut. They crossed the southern perimeter, continued Bigham. They were escaping from trackers. Did you see the trackers? No, sir, but we heard their talking, also gunshots. That was what brought us to the perimeter in the first place. Very well, then. Yes, we have to give them asylum, but it will be on our terms. He turned to Yuki sharply. Your father and son, I take it. Brothers, replied Yuki. Truly? Then that's a runt you bring into the tribe. Yes. If that's as big as he gets, he's no use to us. He'll be your problem. He already is. I I mean, I already take care of him. Do you think you can pull your own weight? Of course. We'll see if you've got what it takes. You can stay if you kill Bigum. My eyes went wide and I looked back and forth between Bigum and brother. Bigum was impassive. This was nothing new to him. I was chilled by his disinterest. Not here, not now, continued the elder. You'll battle tomorrow morning in the arena, for tonight you are our guests. My name is Elder Patrum, and along with Elder Metricula, I oversee the city camp of Sharfenclaw. You will dine with us this evening and be given lodging, but that is the limit of our generosity. If you face Bigam and win, you both can stay. What if we decide to be on our way, asked Yuki, fighting down a tremor in his voice. You don't know these woods. You'd die of starvation before you reach the next city camp, and if not, there's outlaw wolf packs in this region. You'd be ripped apart in a heartbeat. But that's assuming you made it past our borders. Past your borders? Of course. Did you think we'd just let you leave? You've got trackers on your tail. Either you prove your worth to us, or you die quick before the trackers can pick up your trail again. There was a cold deadness, a mirror of Bigham's in the elder Patrum's eyes as he turned with his guards and led us through the bushes into another clearing, this one surrounded by trees. The space had to have been as big as the barn we'd left behind, and it was filled with cats, about a hundred of them, and I realized just how few cats I'd ever seen in my life. Here was a smorgasbord of breeds. I would soon learn that they were tabbies, abyssinians, torties, ragdolls, siamese, and many others. There was something suddenly warm and cheering about the scene of all those cats chatting, playing, bathing, sleeping, and everything else. "'You'll fight in the arena branches,' said one of the guards, nodding upwards. I then realized that there were two great oak trees that imposed on all the rest, and from each a solitary branch extended, meeting above the clearing in the center. 
The arena branches arched out over the canopy like long necrotic arms whose fingers interlaced in the middle. Thick vines wound around the two trees, providing a natural walkway to the top. I became suddenly aware of the hard, unyielding flatness of the earth below. In the center of the canopy floor, the fallen leaves had been cleared away, and the sunlight shot down in a shaft that flooded out across the clearing, but shone primarily on the two boulders. As the branches reached between the shaft of light, their fingers appeared to be washing themselves in the golden radiance. It seemed like a wait, uh, like a way station between life and death, the perfect place for my brother to fight tomorrow morning, at least symbolically. Upon one of the two boulders slept a large Abyssinian female, her beauty striking despite the fre- flecks of gray in her coat. Elder Patrum hopped up onto the other boulder and nudged her awake. She looked up at him bleary-eyed as he spoke to her quietly, then stood, stretched, and yawned, sitting on the rock in full posture. This must have been Elder Matricula, and these were the Elder's thrones. Attention, boomed Patrum in a voice that was suddenly full and encapsulating. All the cats in the clearing turned in interest. These outsiders seek asylum, and by law of the emergency pact doctrine, we must grant it to them. Nevertheless, we shall receive them on our terms. The largest one has agreed to battle Bigham in the arena trees for the right to stay here. A gasp went up from the crowd. But tonight they are our guests, and the dinner hour is upon us. Bring in the kill! A cheer went up as hunters carrying dead mice and a couple of rats pranced proudly to the center, dropping the animals at the feet of the elders. You honor the cycle, we all said, and dove for the kill. I couldn't get any, but brother pulled some guts and flesh out for me. It was my first time eating something other than milk and grubs, and it was delicious. After dinner, we retired to the quarters that had been set aside for us. A sloping hole surrounded by rocks and shrouded by leaves and pine straw. I went back and curled up in a ball. Yuki sat in the center of the burrow, focused his eyes, but was still lost in thoughts, staring at the dirt wall. I didn't need to ask, but I did anyway. What are you thinking about, brother? I'm practicing what's known as the warrior's meditation, Peter. I'm clearing my mind of all of the what-ifs that come from the possibility of my losing the battle. Will it mean my death, and am I prepared for that? What will become of you if I'm not here? Can I kill my opponent if it comes to that? I'm setting all of those thoughts aside. Tomorrow's battle is an equation of muscular mathematics and nothing more. To win, I must enter as an empty blank slate that will acknowledge only the matters of the moment. For that reason, I am giving myself this time to think all of the worried thoughts, the sentimental thoughts, the happy and sad thoughts, and acknowledge each of them. I feel the emotions of each thought to its fullest, thank the thought, and validate its importance. Then I ask it to wait until after the battle. I thought about this for a while as Brother continued to stare impassively at the wall. You are a great fighter, Yuki, I said finally brother shook his head. I just am. Morning came and we were awoken by two females that brought us a breakfast of slaughtered mice which brother declined. I tried to eat a double portion but was full just after the first. The females gave brother a tongue bath but he was indifferent to their charms and practiced flirtations. As they bathed him his gaze returned to the focused meditation of the warrior. He was no doubt purging the litany of dreams that had plagued his slumber. After a time, one of the females nodded to the other and the bath stopped, along with the attempts at flirting. It's time, she said, matter-of-factly, and we were led to the mouth of our den where two guards waited. They nodded a salute, which Yuki reciprocated, then followed them off towards one of the arena trees. I stood among the tightly packed crowd of onlookers watching as Yuki ascended the thick vine that encircled his tree and served as a walkway to the top. He was followed by two guards who sat just off the branch ready to swat back with claws if he tried to escape. 
Bigham, himself accompanied by guards, strode confidently to the ready position on the opposite branch. The crowd parted and the elders strode to their thrones. Once mounted, Elder Matricula spoke out, Fighters! Commence! Balancing on the branches made it impossible for them to circle one another. Brother had his back feet on two of the larger twigs and his front feet on the bow. Bigham was balanced expertly on the opposite bow, so well poised that he was able to bristle and growl with no regard for how the branches shook. Yuki seemed to be thinking about keeping his balance and nothing else. Brother held Bigham's gaze fixedly, bobbing up and down on the branch. Bigham hissed and screeched and Brother responded in kind, but was still waiting for his opponent to make the first move. Bigham lunged past Yuki, landing on the thick of his branch near the trunk. The landing shook the branch and Brother gripped the thinner end of the branch as it went down and released it as it shot back up, launching him into the air. Undaunted, he turned gracefully in the air and landed on the opposite branch, holding Bigham's gaze all the while. I realized then that there was as much battle in their eyes as there was in their bodies. The battle of wills was as great, if not greater, than the battle of muscles. Yuki took quick advantage of his new position and backed up to the thickest part of the branch, close to the end, of, uh, close enough to the end of the trunk to make the guards growl a warning. Backing away, are you, kitten? Bigum taunted from the far end. No more than you, mongrel, replied Brother, though his focus never wavered. He backed up further, and one of the arena guards cautioned him with a harder growl. In that instant, Bigum lunged, his thick legs launching him across both branches towards Yuki, who turned about and bolted towards the arena guards, and they each raised a sharpened claw to deliver Brother a punishing blow. As he closed in on the trunk of the tree, Brother jumped up, connecting with the higher trunk of the tree than the guards could reach, and rebounding over Bigum as he went head first into the, against the bark, the guards blow scratching him instead, ripping bleeding wounds in his already mangled head. Yuki's return jump had been high, but he'd lost distance in trade, and he fell short, grabbing onto one of the twigs, though one thick enough to support him. Bigum rallied himself quickly and came rushing to where Yuki hung, raising his claw to slash Brother's strained paws. Still mindful of his balance, Bigum's tail bobbed and twitched hypnotically as he approached, and Brother watched it carefully. I was afraid then that he was hypnotized by the motion like a prey animal, but instead he was waiting for an opening. I held, I held my breath as Yuki swung from the twig as if on a trapeze and sailed not towards the tree, but towards Bigham's tail and, turning a flip as he went, caught it in his teeth. Blood chorused from Brother's jaws as Bigham screamed in unexpected agony and slipped from his perch, grabbing onto the branch with both claws and crying out again as Brother clawed his way up the mangy body to return to the branch. Bigham was shaking, probably in shock from the sudden brutality. Yuki hopped from one branch to the other, landing just past its middle. He turned around and prepared to lunge as Bigham pulled himself back up. Huffing and snarling, Bigham prepared to lunge as well. They jumped at once and time slowed down as I watched them sail into one another. Brother caught Bigham in a bear hug and propelled him back onto the branch, shattering it into splinters as they sailed down. Brother kicked Bigham in the stomach with his back feet and it thrust them against the tree trunk where his claws dug in as they fell, slowing their descent until they rolled to the ground and landed in a growling, angry clump on the ground. The crowd parted as the, as the ball rolled towards the boulders, coming to a halt under Eldum, Elder Patrum's throne. Enough! boomed the Elder. Bigham and Yuki relented, panting hard as they stepped back from one another. You've certainly won the match, said the Elder coldly, looking down at Yuki. He cheated, sir, spat Bigham. Let me finish him now. You require medical attention said Elder Patrum. Go down to the pond with two, of the, with two of the maids. He needs to die, growled Bigham. Yuki hissed reflexively. That will be all, gumdrop, declared the Elder harshly. From the crowd came purrs of amusement at what must have been Bigham's actual name. 
The mangled guardsman sulked through the crowd, two of the females following behind him as he left the clearing. Your method was ingenious, said Elder Patrum, returning his attention to Yuki. When your environment is what's making the battle impossible, then that's your true enemy, brother replied. Your assignment was to kill him, said Elder Patrum, glaring irritably at Yuki. Why didn't you? I am not of your fold, nor am I seeking to join, Yuki replied. We seek asylum, nothing more. That is an excuse. You are a fighter, but not a killer. Is that wrong? Not necessarily, but it isn't reliable. We won't be a burden to you. That's all I needed to demonstrate. I'll hunt for my brother. We'll, uh, we just need a place to sleep and other cats to surround ourselves with. Your runt brother will slow us down and an albino like you will blow our cover. We might as well... Uh, and an albino like you will blow our cover. Even if you did kill on command, you'd still be useless to us. God damn you, growled Yuki. We're staying here whether you like it or not, so either kill me now or get used to us. Brother's eyes were locked onto Elder Patrum with a murderous finality. The guards bristled and showed their teeth, but Elder Patrum smiled and purred. That's what I wanted to hear, he said warmly but darkly. Welcome to Sharf and Clow. Elders! shouted a gray tabby coming through the brush. What is it, Captain Kristoff? asked Patrum. There's a tracker inside the perimeter. I need all my fighters in position. You heard the captain, barked Patrum. Then he looked back to Yuki and said, I guess we're, we're about to see how useful you are to the camp after all. <laughs>